I'm a feminist, but... <laughs> Hello, Edinburgh! And I'm a feminist, but... I genuinely did think today as I was walking across Bristow Square and I was aware of people watching me, I wish I were a man so I didn't have to think about how I walked. Because you're meant to walk in an elegant way. And sometimes I see myself on film and, or just someone videoing me walking across the stage or something and I think, oh, I hate the way I walk. I think I walk... <laughs> So a lot of people I admire walking, women I admire walking, I don't notice how men walk, women I admire walking bounce up, on their, they're on their sort of, do you know what I mean, they're up, I think I fall side to side like this. And I hate it when I see it, so I'm always like conscious, and I was trying to glide like a Victorian lady across Bristow Square, because I was aware, I was seeing friends, some people going, oh hi, I love your show, coming to the Guilty Feminist, so I was trying to kind of, you know, walk with good posture. And, you know, just look elegant, just so that people would go, isn't she elegant? And uh, much more elegant than I would have thought from listening to the podcast. She just glides across Bristow Square, they'd be saying to each other in my imagination. She just floats. I mean, she's incredible. Just there's something of the sylph about her. I mean, she's not a sylph-like person, admittedly, but she walks like a sylph. That's what I was hoping you'd all be saying. Did anybody see me walking across Bristow Square? Just give me a cheer. No, I have nothing, <laughs> nothing to worry about. No one was even fucking watching me. No one was watching me. And yet I was thinking, oh, this is a lot of work. And as I came up the stairs, uh, 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 I was like, Michelle, a man wouldn't have to worry about it. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but... Woo! Hi, everyone. Are you well? <laughs> and I'm a feminist, but I've been at the Fringe for what feels like a million years. And uh, my go-to flirting technique this whole month has been asking a boy for direction <laughs> to a venue that I'm performing at. <laughs> oh, that's good. It's good. I'm just, I don't know where I'm going. Boop, beep, boop. That's really good. Yeah, and it's worked out brilliantly. I think that's a really, it's a really nice... I think it is. I think there's nothing wrong with pretending you're a bit dumb sometimes. <laughs> there is everything wrong with that, Celia. <laughs> There is everything wrong with it. That's why it's a confession, yes. not something to feel good about. No, this is a practical advice. Everyone go and do it. <laughs> this, this, section is, this section is things we shouldn't do, but we confess to so we make each other feel better. It's not advice for young feminists. Thank you guys for coming to my TED Talk. No! <laughs> <laughs> I'm a feminist, but... Woo! I am devastated that my husband broke his leg because now he's going to find out that I'm not too weak to take the bins out. Oh, yeah. that is devastating because you had is. to cope without him and now it's evident the yeah. things that you can do. Yeah. So there's probably loads of stuff now that he knows you can do. I can probably reach the tea bags. Oh, oh. this is disappointing really on every level. Terrible. It had to happen at some point. I guess so. Yeah. Let's hope he makes a swift recovery for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a feminist, but I, I was a bit hot um, in that interim period after I did mine. So I, I thought, I'll take my cardigan off. So I leant back to just put my phone and my glasses down. I don't know if anyone noticed because I thought, well, you know, Jess is talking, no one will notice. And then I thought, if I start taking my cardigan off now while she's talking, even though I'm hot under the lights, it's going to be a little bit upstagey, so I'll wait. Mm, mm. And I also thought, maybe I could do it in a slightly sexy way. <laughs> because you? I think, now people don't think of cardigans as sexy. <laughs> but, what, <laughs> but what they don't know is, what they don't know is, Things that are revealing aren't necessarily sexy. Like if I had this down, so I've got a dress with a zip on it. If I had this down, so this was all out, Ooh. you'd just be like, it's not sexy because I think, it, I mean, it could be, but on me it wouldn't be because I think you'd look, you'd go, okay, I've seen it now. I can, safe to look away. It's not that great what you're looking at. Like it's fine, it's fine. It's a sort of, it's a D-cup breast on the size of a body that should really have an E-cup. That's all it is that you're seeing there. But... If this is sliding off and sliding back up and sliding off, it, sexy clothes are unstable. You just never know what you might see. So I thought, oh, well, maybe, genuinely in my mind, it was just a flash. This isn't the one I was going to do, obviously, because it's spontaneous. I just thought, well, maybe, as I did my own feminist butt, I could just sort of reveal my shoulders oh, like yes. that. Do you see what I mean? Oh, I it is it. sexy, isn't it? It is. <laughs> Thank you. It is. That, that could have come sooner. <laughs> I think actually I might have learnt about the sexy cardigan from a bit of your stand-up, which I don't uh, want to you, step on. You're about to see it, guys. <laughs> Get ready. Um, uh, I'm a feminist, but 
Um, my stage outfit in my show is a white shirt dress. Um, I know it's good, isn't it? And um, <laughs> someone got up. every day. I have to, I have to wear white underwear. This whole month I've had to wear oh, white underwear. Oh, that's annoying. Every morning feels like my wedding day. <laughs> And I, I pretend I don't like it, but every morning I like, <laughs> and I honestly, I love it. I love it so much. I pretend I'm getting married every day. It's the best. And also, as I sweat throughout the show, a um, bit of glamour, um, the shirt dress becomes see-through. Oh, yeah. Ooh. And, and I, I halfway through the show, everyone kind of goes, <laughs> and I pretend it bothers me. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> Are you like Monica from Friends singing karaoke? Absolutely, yes, 100%. And everyone's cheering and she thinks it's for her singing, but really it's because they can see her tits. Yeah, it's good to like, for next year, no top, let's get it done. <laughs> Again though, it's too revealing. No top, people don't know where to look. Yeah. When, you're, when you're just, a, a bra is glistening underneath, they know exactly where to look and that's I, where they keep looking. Sorry, I just have to finish this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I think that, like, do you know when people say, my eyes are up here? Um, I'm like, look down. Yeah, my breasts are down here. <laughs> my breasts are down here. The Excuse me. <laughs> They're down here. <laughs> well, from one sexy woman to another, I'm a feminist, but I am praying that Liz Truss is our next prime minister because I think it will be absolutely excellent for my career. <laughs> I will be waiting for her to be Prime Minister and hopefully will be Prime Minister for ages Look. and ages and no. ages. <laughs> Jess so Robinson. I can make some, I'm just lifting another woman up. No, you're not! I'm just, I'm just supporting no. another woman. No! <laughs> Look, so. I know the option isn't... There's no good options. No. I get that while the Tories are in power. Yeah. And maybe even when they're not. However, <laughs> however, I mean, we're in Scotland. It's a different landscape here. So I don't know how you feel. Just like you want to get rid of us. <laughs> Just give us a cheer if you're Scottish. <laughs> Just give us a cheer if you cannot wait to go independent at this point. <laughs> Just give us a cheer if you can't wait to rejoin the EU. <laughs> yeah, they don't care if it's Liz Truss. They're good with that. That's why they're not booing. Well, they're okay. like. Oh, Oh, I see. Yeah, they don't care. They're like, <laughs> they're like, we, England is cooked. It's done. It's over. Tell you what, for every pound I make for um, doing a Liz Truss impression, I will put 50p towards um, guilty feminist cocktails. I thought you were going to say some actual feminist good cause. That's, oh, a, good, that's a really bad... Uh, no, I'm a guilty feminist. Jess, <laughs> um, yes, I think that's a terrible oh, yeah, business sorry. plan. You, how are you going to make money? Uh, Before we uplift other women, we should uplift ourselves and our bank accounts. You're right, Again, you're right, Thank you Thalia. guys for coming to my TED Talk. This has gone <laughs> so horribly wrong. We have missed the turn-off so far. <laughs> There's only one thing to say, and it's this. Are we ready to start the show? And welcome, welcome, welcome to the Guilty Feminist. A huge round of applause for Celia, Amy, Jess Robertson, and our incredible guests this evening... People, you'll be seeing a lot more of this afternoon. It's not this evening, is it? It's this afternoon. But it feels like it should be this evening because it's a show. But in Edinburgh, there is no time. There is no darkness. There's no appropriate time for drinking. There's no appropriate time for dancing or laughing. It's just all day, every day, until you've had too much and you want to be sick. That's how it works. So you have a good fringe, everybody! Just give us a cheer if you've seen a show that you think was in some way feminist, could be guilty feminist, could just be feminist feminist, uh, that you think other people should know about and go to. Or, in fact, you are in that show. <laughs> oh, wow. Loads of people. What's yours? Are you in it? Or did you see it? I'm in it. You're in it? You accidentally saw the opposite. Uh, you, you, it's, you saw the opposite of it. Well, oh, actually, I really shouldn't talk about it. No, no, just tell us about your show. So my dear friend and I here, um, we thought we were going to the ballet, and we were very excited for the ballet. I think it's um, the Ukrainian Ballet Freedom. I, I don't know if that's the, the, the word. Date. I got the date wrong, because I'm a silly billy. And as we were on stage waiting for the ballet, we noticed this man came on, and we were like, is this the ballet? And they were like, no, no, no. So um, we were like, maybe we should just see how this plays out. And um, turned out it was... A not-so-great comedian. He's been in the news since. 
um, for... You absolutely saw Jerry Sadowitz instead of the ballet. It was horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing horrifying. less like the ballet than Jerry Sadowitz doing oh. this year's show. And we thought wow. it started out badly because he was dissing scientist and, and here Janet is a, is a very talented scientist. And, oh. then, and it just went very, very So he started by dissing scientists and you thought, yeah. I'm not having that, I'm a scientist. And then <laughs> you went, oh, oh, he's really missed the turn off. Yeah. Um, so uh, you accidentally saw Jerry Sadowitz instead of the ballet. That mm-hmm. in itself is quite sad a wits. Yes. Um, <laughs> what is uh, the show that you do recommend? Um, um, so this is, an anti, this is an anti-ad for a show that's been taken off the fringe. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. What I'm going to ask now is, uh, has anybody, and you might have heard me doing this on the podcast, anybody got an act of feminism that they'd like to tell us about that they've done? And by the way, when I was in Stratford-upon-Avon, somebody went, I co-founded. I went, no, no, but most people will not co-found anything in their whole life. Um, I'm looking for a tiny, minimal act of feminism here. Something that everyone else is going to go, I can do better than that. Anyone got anything? Yes? I gave a guy a sincerest condolences card after rejecting him once. You gave a guy a sincerest condolences card after rejecting him. (laughs) Were you dating him and he had he been a bad boyfriend? He was a bad guy. He was a bad guy. So he hit on you. He was a bad guy. He hit on you. And you just went sincere as... Did you have that in your bag? Because that's a lot of work to go for. If I see that with an ex-boyfriend. You think, yeah, I'm going to get him. But if it's just a guy who like propositions you in the pub that you don't get a great vibe from, it's a lot of work to go across the road and go, have you got anything in the sort of death range? That's a lot of work. Anyone got anything else? Anything? Yes, what's yours? Oh, a stranger in the street told you to smile, and you told him off. You, you didn't smile. She refused, Catherine refused to smile. She said, I don't have to smile, sir. I won't be smiling. I'll never smile again, sir, because of you, because of what you've said. A woman is not there to look charming and sweet. I don't have to pay a smile toll just to exist. Thanks very much. Um, Okay, great. Anyone got anything larger, smaller, uh, or the same as that? Yes? You've been with your uncle? (laughs) (laughs) This is a different friend show now. (laughs) Jeremy Kyle is actually in the wee room this year. You with your uncle in a restaurant? Yeah. So I asked for a bottle of wine. wine. Oh, the waiter gave him the wine to taste. But even though you'd ordered it and you're the wine person. And I said, excuse me. Excuse me. Choose the I chose the bottle. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want to try it? Like... Oh, so you demanded to be the official wine taster. At that moment, did you think, I don't really know anything about wine <laughs> or whether this wine's going to be any good. It's just the fact that I ordered it. Or are you the wine person? You, you sound a bit French, if you don't mind me saying you, you do love wine. So you, did you feel you had the authority? to? Because I would do that. I'd be like, for fuck's sake. Excuse me, sorry. <laughs> I did the wine. May I taste it? And then I'd be there going, mmm. <laughs> what a delicious year. Um, I wouldn't know. But I just don't want, I don't want it to be defected to him. Sometimes when I'm with my husband, he orders a Diet Coke. I know. And I order <laughs> a booze drink. Don't go on about it. And they always give me the Diet Coke. They always give me the Diet Coke. It, I remember, it, I think we were at lunch somewhere and I wanted a beer with my lunch. And there's no, you just know, I was waiting for it. I was like, there's no chance. The same waiter that took the orders cannot imagine a woman wanting a beer when a man wants a Diet Coke. They cannot get their head around it. And in fact, they ask him, you sure you didn't want a full fat Coke? Do you, you know, you sure you didn't want the, the regular Coke? And he goes, no, I want a Diet Coke. And they cannot imagine a world... I mean, I don't know how we are going to get this feminist utopia we're hoping for where no one can imagine a world in which a man orders a Diet Coke and a woman orders a beer. It's a lack of imagination, Edinburgh. But I love that. Where are you from? Romania. Romania. Okay. Is Romania a good place for wine? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Everyone's got to get into Romanian wine. 
Okay. I actually am interested in that, although, as established, I know very little about wine. But I can pose a good game in the right circumstances. Um, has anyone got a project on that they need help with? Anyone trying to raise money for anything? Uh, got a group? Yes? Oh, that's interesting. They're trying to shut all the strip clubs in Edinburgh by 2023. And the women that work in the strip clubs are saying, excuse me, that's our job. The the sex workers union. Oh, the sex workers union is trying to raise money to take them to a legal battle. To keep the venues open. Okay, so is there a, do you know where we can, do we just Google that or do you have a URL or anywhere? So just Google it. Maybe we can find it and put it in the show notes. Or if you could Google it, later in the show you could shout it out and uh, tell us and we can let everyone here know. Will you feel comfortable shouting it out or do I need to nominate a white man sitting near you to do that? <laughs> no, it's true. I found that. I often nominate a white straight cis man to be a, uh, a human Google because they're the only people who feel comfortable interrupting. <laughs> it's not because they're bad. It's not they, I've asked them to do it. I'm not criticising. I... I'm not trying to take that confidence away from them, except maybe to hoover a little bit out to redistribute amongst us. I'm not having a go at them, but I find that uh, later I'll come and say, oh, you never came back to us. They go, no, I didn't want to interrupt. Um, So is anyone a man um, just (laughs) who feels like they'd love to Google something and interrupt? A man who's comfortable Googling and interrupting. Any men who like being right Um, (laughs) in this audience? Any men, any men at all who like to be right? You like being right? Yes, you do like being right. Yes. What's your name? Ewan. Ewan loves being right. Uh, Ewan, are you comfortable interrupting if you've got right information that we should know about? Yeah, yeah great. Okay, so Ewan, you need to Google this so you can give us the information at any point in the show. Um, you know, obviously not actually on someone's punchline, um, but Ewan, use your discretion, but just at some point, just go, hey, I've got the answer to that question. Okay, so now I've deferred that. You don't have to do everything you knew about it. I've taken that responsibility away from you, and I've now imposed it upon Ewan. Because if we don't get the patriarchy working for us at some point, we're going to die from the emotional labor. Um, okay, so Ewan, I don't see you Googling anything yet. Are you just going to tell us something at random and assume you're right? Because I don't want a man of that kind of confidence. It's just going to go, yeah, it's probably this. Sounds right to me. That's the URL I'd make. I don't, I don't see why. I don't see any, any, any right-minded person uh, would think what I've thought. Um, hello, are you latecomers? Excellent. Now, there's one chair too few for a latecomer, but there's a chair down here. Is that helpful? Yes, great. Super, <laughs> lovely. Thank you. Were you late because you're doing an act of feminism? Yes. What was that act of feminism? I was doing a, sh- a show about feminism. You're doing a show about feminism? Yes! <laughs> What was your show? It's called God Who Is A Woman. Oh, you're the third God Who Is A Woman. Oh, fantastic. So are you going to come and join on stage now? Oh, wonderful. Okay. So you're one of the guests. So absolutely. This is why you should, you should never make fun of latecomers. They could have been doing feminism. I don't like it when committees go, oh, and you've probably got a job as well that I can take the piss out of. Um, I don't like it. I don't like it. I'm like, you don't know where they've been from. This is a feminist show. We don't make fun of our latecomers. We ask them how we can support them better. And it turns out they're our guests, so that's a good thing. (laughs) All right. We've got some stand-up comedy for you. We've got some feminist discussion for you. We've got some music for you. Are you ready for an incredible comedy hour? That also makes you think and want to act. Um, then, uh, please welcome to the stage an incredible emerging stand-up comedian who, honestly, it's a bit late. I was saying on the tour she's emerging. She's emerged, really. I think we need to be absolutely honest. Um, her stand-up show has been a sellout run. She came on the uh, nearly every date of the UK uh, Guilty Feminist tour with us. She's an incredible talent. Please put your hands together and make incredible welcoming woohooing noises for the wonderful Celia A.B. <laughs> Hello everyone, are you well? Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit sleepy, isn't it? You good? Yeah. Fantastic, so my name is Celia A.B. Uh, the accent that you're hearing is going to stay on the whole time, hope that's okay. This accent is from France and so am I. Um, <laughs> it'd be weird if I picked it. 
Uh, all you need to know about me is that when I first moved to England, I introduced myself to a man as Celia, and he went, it's Celia. <laughs> and then me, quick as a flash, because I've got one of those really quick comedians' minds, I went with Celia for six years. <laughs> Until about two years ago, I was chatting to a friend of mine. I said, my name is Celia in France, but in England, it's Celia. And she went, oh, that's not a thing. <laughs> Had to reintroduce myself to everyone in my life. They thought I was going through a weird cultural rebrand. <laughs> I'm Celia now. I uh, moved to England for a reason and a reason only. I used to love everything about it. The TV show, the films, the music. I used to watch a TV show called Skins. Remember Skins? For ages, I thought I liked drugs. Turns out, I like friendship. <laughs> Inject it in my veins. <laughs> Love friendship. Um, do I identify as a pick-me girl. Do you know what a pick-me girl is? Pick-me girl is the type of girl that's like, I'm not like the other girls. A bit different. Uh, I'm not like the other girls because like, I like live music. <laughs> do you guys like live music? I love live music. Um, I pretend to like Arcade Fire all the time. <laughs> and I think everyone does. Um, but I, I do like loads of Pick Me Girl stuff. Like, um, once I read a book. <laughs> finished it and everything. <laughs> Honestly, I think it's hard to know if you liked a book or if you just finished it. Because <laughs> every time I finish a book, I'm like, ooh, look at me. <laughs> first person I speak to today is getting a book recommended. <laughs> this book is my personality now. I like books, but I think they're too long, aren't they? <laughs> Stop typing. <laughs> We've got stuff on, we're busy. Sometimes you'll spend hours and hours reading a book, and you hate it, you want to be on your phone, but you can't. <laughs> and your phone's like, I'm fun. <laughs> But sometimes you spend hours and hours reading a book and then you give it all your trust and love and at the end that it turns out, the narrator, not even reliable. <laughs> I don't know anyone else in this book. And I've spent it with the biggest bullshitter in town. <laughs> uh, other pick-me-girl things I do, I, I pretend I like football. Do you like football? No, no good. <laughs> I, uh, I pretend like, I've got a good way of pretending like I know about football. Like, if someone tells me the name of their favorite team, I'll just go, hmm, what a year for them. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't, but I just know that nine times out of ten, I'll get a, yeah. <laughs> uh, the reason I'm trying to get into football is because I met this guy, and you might want to stay seated for this bit. Um, so he told me that he could have... Oh, do you know him? <laughs> he said he could have gone professional. But then, tragically, he injured his knee. And when he told me that, I was like, oh my God, we need to tell Netflix. It's a six-parter at least. Um, and I think what's amazing about it is the amount of almost professional footballers who end up in all bar one. I think we need to run the numbers on that. It's incredible, the odds of it. To the point where I think football teams, they should recruit backwards. Like if a young boy starts showing interest in bottomless brunch. <laughs> get insurance on his knees, get the boy trained up, he's going to be a star. <laughs> Other pick-me-girl things I do, I, uh, I, I, again, I love live music, I love all of that. I, um, I've got a tote bag. You got a tote bag? Oh my god, relatable. <laughs> my, my experience of shopping changes drastically depending on what I put in that tote bag. Like if I'm just buying fruits and veg and I pop that in my tote bag, I'm like, <laughs> who is she? <laughs> She's probably Italian. She probably wears cardigans that fall off her shoulder in the summer. She likes arcade fire. <laughs> but if I'm buying meat, like raw meat, 
and I shoved that in my tote bag. My whole vibe changes, and I'm like, I'm a little goblin. <laughs> I'm gonna eat this raw on the bus. <laughs> don't look at me, children, and the meat goblin. Still don't know how to recover from saying meat goblin. <laughs> Done 24 shows, still no idea. I bet pick me girls, she'll do crazy things. She can do, she can, she'll do crazy things. She'll, um, she can eat an entire pizza. <laughs> She's so random. I think it's weird that when you eat an entire pizza, you're chill, but you eat one entire quiche. <laughs> and then your whole life, you're quiche lazy. <laughs> Every room you walk in for the rest of your life, oh, there she is, Lorraine. Um, I am from Paris, from the outskirts. I take a lot of boxes, I do. I do. Uh, I'm also half Algerian. You don't know where that is, so I'll tell you. <laughs> it's a small Muslim country just outside Slough. <laughs> but on the outskirts, I'm bi, which used to get a woo, but now it's more of a, yeah, you're a comedian. <laughs> and I had to come up to my mom as bi, and she's very cute. She's a bit clumsy. I said, Mom, I'm bi. And she said, ooh, why? <laughs> but I believe it's my role to medicate her. She grew up in a small Muslim country in Oxfordshire for her. <laughs> so hard to understand. So I said, Mom, the reason I'm bi is because of the vaccine when I was eight years old. <laughs> I go out and protest. I think I've become too polite. I've become British. I think I have. I never used to be. But everything I did is now seen as arrogant as a French person. Like, through the lens of Frenchness, I'm, it's, everything is seen as arrogant. Like, once, I said the word croissant properly. <laughs> Everyone lost their mind. They said, say it wrong. <laughs> well, don't say it at all, Celia. <laughs> They've become too polite. I've ended my will with, honestly, no worries if not. <laughs> And that's my time! Sally Rape, everybody! It is our seventh birthday show on the 1st of October. Guess where we're going to be? The legendary Hammersmith Apollo. That's right. We are finally live at the Apollo. Confirmed guests include Rachel Paris, Grace Petrie, Sin V, Kima Bob, Desiree Birch, Susan McComa, and, and the creators of Six, Lucy Moss and Toby Marlowe. And... Secret surprise musical guests that we're not allowed to talk about yet. Uh, so get your tickets now. We are at the London Podcast Festival, Saturday, the 10th of September. We are doing Global Pillage and also a crossover episode of The Guilty Feminist with Brown Girls Do It Too. It's at King's Place. Get tickets now. We'll be at Ulster Hall in Belfast on the 14th of October and you can get tickets for all of these shows at guiltyfeminist.com To support the podcast and get ad-free episodes go to patreon.com slash guiltyfeminist And now, back to the podcast um, This is The Guilty Feminist the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which That's as close as I'm ever going to get to being like you know I'm like a bird. My audience is better at finishing my lyrics than they are the lyrics of whoever sang I'm like a bird. It's, um... Oh, God, who sings that? Nelly Furtado, thank you. I'm so bad with names. Nelly Furtado from Promiscuous. No way. She's versatile, isn't she? <laughs> I'm Deborah Francis White. With me is Celia A. B. Um, and we are at the Edinburgh Fringe. Our guests today are the founders of physical theatre company Silent Faces and the creators of their latest show, Godo is a Woman, in which they playfully explore authorial copyright, gender barriers in the arts, and the cultural significance of Madonna's 1989 album, Like a Prayer. 
please welcome to the stage Josie, Jack, and Cordelia. <laughs> Now, Hello. there's three of you goddos. Is it okay to split you up so that we can be in the middle? Yeah. Just pick yeah. a mic, any mic. I'm just glad you guys show up with a name like Goddo is a woman. This is a really good reference if you've read Waiting for Goddo. <laughs> <laughs> Have you tried reading one book? <laughs> I so, get the reference and I'm in that show. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true, actually. It would have been really funny if you just never arrived. Oh. Yeah. So we'd had to sit here padding and padding. So, yeah. spoiler alert, but does everyone know the play? And some of our global listeners may not know. Um, I don't know how far... I know it's very big, obviously, in Ireland. Beckett's Irish and in Paris because he went to... In France because he lived in France and translated all his plays into French. Uh, but I don't know if it travels absolutely everywhere all over the world. And also, people are young sometimes. I don't know if you've heard about young people, but loads of young people, Gen Zs and younger, listen to this. And you can't know everything when you're 14 just because you haven't had the time and you've been on TikTok. So... <laughs> Um, if you don't know, Waiting for Godot, or as the Americans say, Waiting for Godot. <laughs> Why do they say that, though? Why, is that how it's said in French? Um, what do you say? Uh, it's called En attendant Godot. 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 That was lovely, wasn't it? Mm, say croissant. Croissant. No, oh, nice. Um, so <laughs> say it again in French. En attendant Godot. En attendant don, don? Godot. Godot. This is the whole thing, by the Godot. way. <laughs> okay, Godot. 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 So maybe they say it because they think it's more French, mm -hmm. waiting for Godot. But they've forgotten that he was an Irish playwright. Twats. <laughs> now, so sorry. If you're American, I'm joking. You're lovely, unless you're not. Now, uh, so uh, it's a play, and it's a very surrealist play about two... It's sort of the sprite or the child within us. Very... Seems very non-gendered, non-sexualized. Two characters. Um, and there's thirds. There's... How many characters are in Waiting for Godot? Got there's it. actually five. There's five. Yeah. Okay, but there's two famous ones, and the then there's main ones. other bits. Yeah. Um, so the two main characters are waiting for Godot, and they're talking about Godot the whole time. And spoiler alert, but Godot never arrives because it's like you know you're waiting for God to come down and do something, and it's the, the sort of the, the thing as human beings we eternally wait for that never happens, and we're always in the future waiting. And it's it's about what it is to be human. It's completely surreal. Now, how does the Beckett estate? approach these famous sprite-like androgynous characters? So the Beckett estate and Samuel Beckett until he died in 1989 insisted and still insist that they are male characters. So they have to be men. And the reason for this, Beckett said, was because women don't have prostates. Um, <laughs> Seems very specific. It's very specific. It's very specific. Also just incorrect. Yeah. Well, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. What, I mean, presumably in 1989, yeah. he was not factoring in trans women. No, I don't think he was. I mean, it sounds like if he was alive now, he wouldn't be anyway, but he wasn't in 1989. Will they let trans women do the show? We don't know. Will they let trans men do the show? We also don't know. Um, Jack, you're non-binary. Do you think that helps the case at all? Um... I'm fairly sure that if I were to ask, they'd probably say no. I did suggest that maybe at one point, if they'd like to do like a blood hormone panel on me, I do officially have the blood of a cis man. Do you? That sounds like I stole it. Um, <laughs> it's mine. I made it myself. I'm still, I'm making it right now. Um, but yeah, so I did sort of wonder, you know, if I take my hormone panel to them and go, oh, look, my hormones are officially male levels now. Uh, I don't have a prostate, though, so I've been seeing about getting one fitted, but... Yeah. What? So... <laughs> fitted. So, <laughs> what... So, what would happen if you got the rights to Waiting for Godot and then, on the night, you said it was going to be two men, but on the night, the men were in on it and it was two women or a woman, a non-binary person that came out onto the stage. What would they do? You'd get done. You'd get done. You'd get really? Done. So, how many years do you get for doing that? Because <laughs> that would be ironic if it was a long time and you're waiting for the sentence to end. It would be, I mean, yeah. it'd be wonderful. Yeah. I mean, there's lots and lots of examples, and uh, if you see the show, please do. Um, spoilers um, that there are of cases. I think it's about kind of seven or eight different court cases slash examples of people since the 80s who have tried to do Waiting for Godot with a female cast. Oh, my gosh. Now, some people have won. 
but have one have where one. so there's one company a dutch company who replaced two men with two women because the two men dropped out of the production yeah but they had to do the show as men like they had to look like men right and even then it was seen that it was like cross dressing right um there's another example um i think in the early 90s is it where they were allowed to do it but there had to be a letter of objection read before every single performance. Where? What? So literally someone coming out onto stage and being like, the Beckett estate and Samuel Beckett do not authorise this. Well, please welcome to the stage. Yeah. I would love that because I think that yes. adds to the art, but it's, yeah. I think that's quite Beckett in itself. To it have. Is. Why, when he was such an absurdist, was he so rigid about this? I think the thing was he was an absurdist, yes, but first and foremost he was also... A misogynist. Right. Um, <laughs> right. The, misogynist first episode is second. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. Really, So many yeah. surealists were, though. Yeah. That's, is... that's a really interesting thing, that if you look into the history of surrealism, they could get their head around sort of, you know, moustaches falling off walls like the middle of a dream, but not the idea of women being a thing. I know. <laughs> yeah. Like, they could... It's too much for them. It's, it's too, too much. much. So tell us about your show and what it's trying to say, and I'm sure saying... No, let me ask that again, because that sounds like, what, it's, what, are you, what, are you, what are you little ladies trying to do here? <laughs> what are we trying to do? do? No, so let me take that again. So what is your show, and what is it saying about this way that women are excluded, in a frankly absurd way, given there are now... Did Beckett not hear about female King Lears and things? By 1989, it must have been female Hamlets. Yeah, it's not that long ago. Like, I think 1989... It is actually um, quite a long time ago. That's the scary it? part. It's going to make... At the moment I think about it, I feel horribly old. <laughs> But it's like over 30 years ago. It goes back to the future one out. That, that's how yeah. I measure time, by the way. How do you measure it? Back to the future one. Was it out? I think it was out. Yeah, it was out. Insane. So it's this post Back to the Future. It's, it's post, this post Back, back to, to the Future era. So Godot had seen Back to the Future. Not Godot, no, sorry. Beckett never came. He didn't sorry, Godot never came. That's the point. <laughs> Beckett had seen Back to the Future. That's yeah. so funny. Imagine Beckett going to the <laughs> that's cinema. So funny. And watching Marcy and... You know, I bet he did. I bet he did. I bet on the side he was a, he was a massive <laughs> normcore guy. Because you just know it, don't you? You just know it. Secretly, he's at home watching Cheers. <gasps> Do you know what? I've just really realised Beckett heard the song Living on a Prayer. That's insane, isn't it? Oh, my mm. God. Yeah. He, he, I mean, like a prayer. I didn't think, like, Dream playwrights could... No, they were allowed to listen out. to rock. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He will have heard... He will, he'll have known who Madonna was. He probably partied with her. <laughs> Um, so they come and do you, basically. And if you, you can risk, presumably, what paying money, having your production taken off, and then you lose all the costs of the production and you can't make anything back. Has anyone been sued and taken to court successfully? Yeah, I think people have been sued successfully. Yeah, for and stopped it. doing it. Yeah, well, they're, so they're... you can't risk it, basically, unless you're very rich. Lots of productions have been pulled mm. just before they've gone on. So... And then you've, you've put all the money into the rehearsal yeah. and everything and you can't get that back. So what's your show about? Our show is about us waiting for Waiting for Godot. Oh. So we're, we're on the phone to the Beckett estate oh, waiting fantastic. for them to pick up. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, and then twiddling our thumbs and, and uh, trying to fill the time while, while we wait. Do you actually call them every day when you do it live on stage? And if they ever answer, like you just have to disrupt the show to improv it. I want that. Can that's I, a great idea. That's a can great we idea. do that we one do that night? Idea. Can we do that? If I come one night, can we do like, or could we re, could I reproduce it somewhere where we're just for one night only? Or it'd have to be day actually, wouldn't it? It'd have to be day because you can't call out of business hours and expect someone to pick yeah, up. Yeah, no one picks up anymore now. anyway. There's nobody's got phones anymore. They just go, oh, look at the website. And that's not <laughs> theatrical. But just yeah. say, there must be a number and there must be someone, God, it'd be brilliant to really call them. Yeah, we, we made up a, a website for them. What's it called? Uh, www.thebeckettfoundation.org.uk slash rights. Slash rights. I don't so know if that so that's not a real website? I don't think so. It I might be. <laughs> and so you're imagining a world, basically. You're waiting for a world in which you can perform this play. Yeah. We're, and in the meantime, you're performing a play about waiting to perform the play. Yeah, we're in a world where we've put an application in, but we haven't heard back from our application. Right. But we've got to the day, and we've got an audience, and we've got all the set and the costumes. That's amazing. Uh, so we're just waiting for them to pick up and say yes. Have the Beckett Estate shown any interest in your show and been concerned? Have they sent anyone down, do you think? Oh, God. They're, Not that I mean, we know of. I feel like they would come incognito. I feel like they'd wear, like, something quite cool. 
and yeah. kind of sit in the back <laughs> row, maybe smoke a cigarette, and I'd be like, who's that? Who's that cool? Yeah, but no, as far as I'm aware, there's not, I've not seen anyone You've smoking You've not seen a man in a trench coat and a trilby <laughs> smoking... With an umbrella uh, out and somehow it's raining. <laughs> Can you imagine if that was the, the secret man they sent down? Because you know it's going to be a man they're going to send out. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And what are the themes of the show? Um, it's all about sort of the idea of permission. I think, obviously, the jumping off point is there's a show that we love, that we want to perform, that is, you know, a representation of humanity and that, you know, we believe we have the right to play. But then when you extrapolate that further, it's asking questions about, like, whose voices are worth hearing, mm. whose stories are worth hearing. And what do we say when we say, OK, we want humanity to be represented by two cis men? What does that say for anyone who's not a cis man? What does that tell us about... Yeah, are we not human? Are we not human enough? Are we sort of like human light? If you prick me, do I not bleed cisgendered male blood? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that was a thing, by the way. Oh, I didn't. Yeah, Yeah. there you go. Um, That's fascinating. So, in fact, are you exploring whether or not you even want to put Beckett's play on if he's such a misogynist as to not want you to put it on? And that's funny. The response to this show is really interesting and very divisive like a lot of people like the Beckett lovers out there we are Beckett lovers ourselves you know it's not like, like you being like but yeah exactly <laughs> I'm sorry Sam I'm so sorry um but why why do you have to make it you know so difficult and can't you just go and do something else and um yeah it gets quite like a it's got quite a divisive like response like we're just being we're making a fuss Mm. And actually, the show is not that. First and foremost, it's a love letter to Beckett. It's like, mm. we love your work. Mm. We're so inspired by it. It's amazing. Do you think there's hidden misogyny in it, though? Because oh, yeah. if, do you see what I mean? Like, how can someone be that exclusive? And again, if, this, if it died in 1924, you could understand someone living in the power structures of the world and not being able to see beyond that. You can't expect... Uh, people to be prophets outside their time. But in 89, post, he's yeah. working girl. Yeah, he could have seen working girl. Yeah. We're talking about the, the post Back to the Future era. <laughs> we're talking about post Dolly Parton in 9 to 5, guys. Mm. Yeah. It was yeah. the whole era was about women trying to break through. Yeah. And so he wasn't not just ahead of his time. He wasn't of, as an old man, presumably, he wasn't of his time. Yeah. So... Um, I mean, old men are rarely of their time, are rarely of the last day they live, are they? But I still think, is there, if, if the Beckett Foundation turned around and went, okay, we sent a man down to see your show to check that it wasn't infringing on our copyright, and we were so persuaded by it, you're allowed to put it on. Would you put on Waiting for Godot? Maybe as a gimmick. Yeah, maybe do like yeah, a little Godot. one night only. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Followed by Godot as a woman. I don't think we would, you know. And I actually think, the whole process of making this play is like, let's make something else. And I think mm. we had to make this play to be like, what should we make and what should we be making? And actually, the whole thing that this one guy in the 1950s wrote this ultimate play about what it is to be human, mm. but he has it under such strict censorship. And then he's, he's died and his estate has continued on with this strict rule. It's just like... As human beings, we just love to live in the past, and you're exactly mm. right. And, and this, this show essentially sits around the fact that Beckett died in 1989, mm. and that is the year that Madonna released her Like a Prayer album. Oh, there you go. You actually were you on the right track. It. You were there. I guess there's more than meets the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I said it in the introduction. You probably picked it up from that. Yeah. Um, it probably just went in. It probably just filtered in. Um, so, like a prayer. <laughs> oh, you knew what you were doing. Wow. You listened and you heard. And I, you I actually, I was too busy reading feminist literature. I see. And I, yeah, I was just too busy. Yeah. I've got it. I've got it. I mean, I can't wait to see the show. I think it's really exciting. Are you going to tour it after the Fringe? Yes. Yay! Yeah. Where's it going to go to? Do you know? Not sure yet. Going to work on it now. Yeah, we're in the process of um, convincing people and, and working it out. Well, if this show comes out and uh, produces your listening, uh, it's had great reviews in Edinburgh. Oh, yeah. And if you're listening and you've got a venue and you would like to have it, and you think, oh, my God, I'm waiting for Waiting for Godot. Um, I'm waiting for Waiting for Waiting for Godot. Yeah, that's my thing. I'm, Godot. Put I'm waiting afterwards. for Waiting for Waiting for Godot as a woman. Yeah. Then uh, you can get in touch. We can put your details in the show notes. Um, is there anything that you came to say today about 
this or anything, anything in these ideas around women and non-binary people having more of a, a voice and a face in the theatre or, in fact, authorial control that you didn't get to say? Anything else you want to talk about? Yeah, I think for me, especially, one of the things we touch on in the show is that a lot. one of the excuses that we kind of give in the show is, okay, you can't do Waiting for Godot, then he wrote plays with women, and why don't you do a play that he wrote with women? And then my big thing is, he didn't write any plays for non-binary people. Shock, horror. Um, and there actually, you know, aren't a wealth of roles out there, and there are incredible non-binary actors out there working today. Most of us carving our own niches. I love that I've just included myself in the group of amazing, amazing non-binary actors. <laughs> Listen, you've got the blood of a cisgendered man. Get in there. <laughs> this is why. Get the, the in blood there. Then. Amazing, amazing, Jack. Amazing. amazing. I'm amazing. It is amazing what testosterone does. It really does suddenly make you go, I'm fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> not that I'm recommending anyone do it, but I'm not recommending you don't. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, like we're living in such a different world now and, you know, there's still these bullshit arguments of like, oh, is it real? Oh, are trans people, oh, what are trans people asking for? And like, I just, yeah, I, I really want to see more trans actors out there. I really want to see more trans stories out there. I really want to see people who have felt previously that their voices weren't worth hearing for whatever reason, just marginalised voices getting out there and, and telling these stories because while Waiting for God is great, Shakespeare's great, we've got this amazing canon, we can't live in the past. We have to move and grow. And actually... Like, have you seen the state of British theatre? We definitely can live in the past. Yeah. And we do, all yeah. the time. We're trying our it's, bloody best, aren't we? We've got about four theatres dedicated to the work of one man. Which is yeah. wild. Yeah, yeah I just, who, who probably nicked some of his ideas from women. I mean, it's, it's doubtless. wild. Wild. One of the things that also feels um, like we cover in this is that all like one of the reasons we wanted to do Waiting for Godot in the first place as a company is because we've made three shows now. The first one is a clown show about corporate responsibility and the second one is a, a dance piece about depression. Um, and they're both very niche. So <laughs> our audiences weren't very big. So we were like, well, to get ourselves out there as a company, let's do, a, do something that people know. And the stuff that people know... Is things like Godot and Shakespeare and all those things that we don't have access to. So um, there's a barrier in not just doing these plays, but doing plays that people will come and see mm. because they're written for people that aren't us. Um, so we're being cheeky and using Godot to give ourselves a platform to talk about our stories and mm. and help ho hopefully help carve the the way for more people to talk about their own stories that aren't just cis, mm. straight, white men. And actually, it originally was going to be called Waiting for Waiting for Godot. But that's already a play no. written by another cis white man. Oh. So, <laughs> Weren't allowed to do so that either. We, are, we were like, do you know what? We've got a better idea. Let's do mm. Waiting for Waiting for Godot. And then it became Godot as a woman. And then it became about Ariana Grande. And then it became about Madonna. Um, wonderful yeah. well I absolutely can't wait to see it I've seen the reviews and I just love the idea of it it, it makes me excited sell your AB is there anything else you want to tell this audience should they come to your show uh, yeah I've got an extra show that I've added it was uh, it sold, it, the run is sold out but this extra show was ambitious to say the least <laughs> Um, there's a few tickets left it would be great to see uh, all of you I mean you won't, this audience won't fit in the room um, it's the OT <laughs> Where is it? Seriously. Um, it's at Pleasance Beside at 8.45 what, on Saturday. What day? Saturday, 8.45. A full 30 minutes after my first show. Oh, so, wow. I know. I'll see if I remember it. <laughs> so Pleasance Beside, 8.45 this yep. Saturday. Go along. Every other show of Sedia Bees is sold out. Uh, can I also recommend shows that aren't mine quickly? Yeah. Uh, Amy Gledall is really funny. Uh, she's just been nominated for Best Newcomer. I think she's incredible. And I think you should go check her out. And any comedian from Birmingham, because that's where I lived for a long time, go and check them out. They're all really brilliant. Josh P, that sort of lot, go and see them. They're fantastic. Amazing. Um, can I have a huge round of applause for Josie, Jack and Cordelia? <laughs> and keep that applause going for one of my favourite acts at this fringe, any fringe, and in life. It's the incredible Jess Robinson! <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm a feminist, but I love a Disney princess. Oh, I do. But do you know there has never been a single Jewish Disney princess ever? I know, it's weird, isn't it? Especially since there's no actual proof that Walt Disney was actually a Nazi. And legally, I'm definitely not saying that. Um, also, legally, I'm not actually allowed to cover any Disney songs. Um, so what I've done here is I've made up my own bootleg Disney characters. You know, like they do on the side of ice cream vans. Uh, see if you can recognize any in this Disney mega mix. <laughs> to pay tribute to Disney, but we can't put one foot wrong, cause Disney's lawyers, well they'll destroy us if we use a single real Disney song, the planet's crust might be breaking, but Mickey Mouse will still be litigating, so let's hope they don't see this bit. Alright guys, what's your favourite Disney film? There are so many to choose from. What's yours? I like the one about the beast who wants to take a beautiful girl on a date. It's called Beauty and the... No! No, I didn't say it. It's called Hot Girl and the Man who is punching above his weight. Oh, and it's got this beautiful song. The crockery can talk. He can chit-chat with his plate, then cover it in flan. Hot girl and the man punching Barbie's weight. Yeah. One film down, but we must have the one about the guy who was king of the lions. It's called The Best Lion. Anyway, it's not this bit where Simba, I mean Simon, is sat beneath the stars with his girlfriend Pat. They're looking at each other and it's so romantic and the music goes like this. Lion pornography. Let's see what's on ITV. Or the one about the chili girl, and she freezes things. It's called. It's got this great song about letting it go, and the music goes a bit like this. Let go of it. Let go of it. God, it's bloody cold out here. Let go. Oh, no, fuck it, it's probably fine. <laughs> but my very favorite Disney film is the one about the mermaid. She's half fish, half woman, and it's called The Little Mermaid. No! It's called The Tiny Fish Girl. And the greatest Disney song for me is the one about her wishing she could leave the These films mean so much to us So mini Mickey, Donald, Goofy, please don't to us And come and see the show, that would be the best Be our guest, shit! <laughs> Thank you! Jess Robinson, everybody! <laughs> um... Jess, uh, thank you so much for coming on. A huge round of applause for Jess Robinson. Thank you. Huge round of applause uh, for the Gotto Gang. <laughs> for the incredible Celia AB. You've got to see all of those shows. Just give us a cheer if you're going to see all of those shows. <laughs> Someone's just waving there. What were you going to say? <laughs> he interrupted! <laughs> 
I love him. Uh, Ewan, please tell us. uvwunion.org.uk and uh, they are a union of sex workers and they are protesting uh, the closing of their places of business. So please uh, go and check it out and see if you can give them some support. Thank you so much, Ewan! And on that note of extraordinary male confidence, I suggest that this episode of The Guilty Feminist is convened... Thank you so much, Edinburgh, for coming out. You've been absolutely wonderful. Please come and see us again tomorrow. And if you can't, send somebody else who will. Uh, we're here every day till Sunday. And you're going to see lots of other acts that you can go and see. This is like seeing three fringe shows plus the Guilty Feminist in one. So if you come again tomorrow, it's like you've seen four shows. Um, who wouldn't want to do that? Thank you so much, Edinburgh. We've been the Guilty Feminist. I've been Deborah Francis White. Goodbye! We have been listening to the Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host, Sonia A.B. and my very special guest. Cordelia Stevenson, Jack Wakeley, and Josie Underwood, with music from Jess Robinson. The Guilty Feminist theme tune was composed by Mark Hodge. The recording engineer was Hamish Campbell. The producer for the Spontaneity Shop was Tom Slinsky. Thanks to Bjorn, Jody, Karen, and all and everyone at the Guilty Balloon, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. That's okay. That's a bit of fun. Don't, I asked for that. I said, give me the shortest lead you have. I said, I want the most awkward start. Isn't that the stand-up mic? I thought that was the stand-up mic. She said, it's this one that I need to grab. Oh, okay. Because that never... one was there for stand-up, I thought. It had no lead at all. Anyway. Hi, Sorry. everyone. The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.